Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church this morning and welcome to another Sabbath school. Today we will be studying lesson number six, Jesus, the faithful priest. Whether you're joining us online or in person, I say welcome. I hope that you enjoyed studying this lesson this week. Uh, my name is Paula Fox, and joining me today is Elder Nathan Fowler and Elder Wayne Martin. And they're going to help me lead us through this wonderful lesson that we studied this week. Uh, before we go any further, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be here yet another day, yet another Sabbath. We thank you in a special way, God, for your words and for your words that show us and teach us more about you. And the more we learn about you, God, the more we learn about how much you love us. And so today, as we lead through this lesson, as we walk through each day, I pray that everyone who is under the sound of my voice will receive a message, will receive a blessing, something that will draw them even closer to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 And so this week, we studied about Jesus, the faithful priest. Our memory text for this week was taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 7 and verse 26. And I'll go ahead and read in your hearing. It says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from, others, from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Wow. Jesus, our high priest. Now, when we think about the word priest in an earthly sense, it's defined as someone who is authorized to perform the sacred rites of a particular religion, especially and mainly as a mediator between God and man. In Hebrews 7 and verse 26, Jesus is recognized as the high priest, and the attributes of his title are described. He is fitting for us. Holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and higher than the heavens. So we're going to walk through each of those qualifications this morning about why Jesus was the one to be the high priest. Now, Jesus was given this role particularly and mainly to redeem us from sin. You see, the entrance of sin into the world caused a deep separation between God and man. Our lesson makes the point that God is holy, and sin cannot exist in his presence. Therefore, in order to restore us to be able to in, be in communion with God, to be in God's presence, something had to be done about the problem of sin. In this week's lesson, we look at the priesthood of Jesus Christ, its origin and purpose, the characteristics of his priesthood, how he differed from men who served in this world prior to him, and how it affects our relationship today with God. As we begin our lessons review, Elder Martin will guide us through Sunday's lesson, A Priest on Behalf of Human Beings. Thank you, Sister Fox. In Sunday's lesson, we focused, like she rightly said, a priest on behalf of human beings. And I believe that throughout human history, and still today, men, and women have felt the need for priests. Conscious of their unworthiness, they have reached out to other humans whom they regard as being close to God and therefore able to present their prayers and other needs in a manner that God will accept. In reality, however, there has been and is only one real priest, the God-man Jesus Christ who in his own person brings us into the very presence of God. And I found that really exciting this week. Now, let me clarify, all other priests that we have studied in the Levitical system were but shadow priests. They themselves stood, as the lesson brought out, and stand in need of a mediator. That is why even the high priest in the earthly sanctuary had to offer sacrifices for his own sin as well as for the sin of the people. This week, our anchor text was Sunday, Hebrews 5, chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, discusses the role of the priesthood 
and how Jesus perfectly fulfills that role. Come with me as we look a little bit deeper into Sunday's lesson. In Sunday's lesson, we rediscover that the basic purpose, and this is right at the very top of your lesson, that the basic purpose of the Levitical priesthood was to mediate between sinful people and God. Priests, we're told, were appointed by God. I'm so happy that they were not voted in or, you know, a show of a right-hand majority you're in. They were appointed by God in order to minister in behalf of human beings. Therefore, they needed to be merciful, the lesson brought out, understanding, and very understanding of human weaknesses. The lesson also brought out that although Jesus' priesthood is different from the Levitical priesthood, Aaron, the Levitical high priest you saw in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 4, was compared to Jesus. And despite the clear differences between them, the the similarities, I believe, do warrant further investigation this morning. So bear with me as I go down and compare Aaron and Jesus' priesthood. In Hebrews chapter 4, in Hebrews chapter 5 rather, verse 4, we see that Aaron is shown in parallel to Christ. Both are human, both are chosen by God, and both work on behalf of humankind. They offer sacrifices, and their ministry and service are for the sins of humanity. Jesus is human, but notice this very distinction. He is also the Son of God. Aaron was not. A crucial point stressed in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Where a quote from Psalms 2, if you studied deeply, you would have realized that that was found in Psalms 2, is followed by one in Psalms chapter 1, Psalms chapter 110, which links the sonship with the priesthood, because Jesus is the Son of God bestowing the Melchizedek priesthood on him. There's also some other difference I want us to look at real quickly. Although both Jesus and Aaron offered sacrifices, the sacrifice of Jesus is a single sacrifice, sufficient for all humankind, because it forever validate, it's forever valid and effective. It cannot be replaced by others. Furthermore, Jesus is both sacrifice and priest. Did you see that in the lesson this week? And thus, so far, surpasses Aaron who was a priest alone. He, Aaron, could never be a sacrifice. Only Jesus could. Yes, Aaron presented the blood of lambs and of bulls and goats. Jesus presented his life of perfect obedience. And then his death on the cross, which constitute the sacrificial offering that Jesus presented before the Father, our high priest, that very last line in Sunday's lesson. Also, unlike Aaron and all other priests, Jesus was never tainted by sin. You know, the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Jesus are both said to deal with sympathetically, to deal sympathetically with the sinner. However, this is only true for the ideal Levitical priest, because you know the Bible gives us many examples where the priests were either quiet, rude, uncaring, and unfaithful. Do I need to remind you of Nahab, Nadab and Abihu, or the sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, who perverted the very sanctuary services in their time? Hebrews stresses the aspect of Jesus' ministry. And although being sinless himself, he sympathizes with sinners and is merciful and faithful in dealing with them. For Scripture declares in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all point tempted like we are, yet without sin. I must go on, but let me say this before I end. The teaching of Jesus as our great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary is a precious truth that is given to the Seventh-day Adventist church to share with the world. In essence, this truth 
gives us the assurance in the reality of a blessed hope of the soon return of Jesus Christ. And last but not least, the teaching of Jesus as our great high priest, it reminds us that the sanctuary is a place of power. Jesus not only understands and sympathizes with us in our struggle, but he gives us overcoming power. Jesus is the only one who is indeed qualified to fulfill the role of our high priest. Awesome. Amen. Thank you, Elder Martin. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for making it clear why Jesus is the perfect priest to represent us before God. We're going to continue to talk about what makes Jesus the only priest that truly is effective under Monday's lesson according to the order of Melchizedek. And Elder Fowler will lead us through Monday's lesson. Thank you, Doctor. I had the awesome responsibility of examining Genesis uh, 14, 18 through, 18 through 20 and identify who Melchizedek is and exactly how does he prefigure Jesus Christ. And what a wonderful study opportunity for me. Uh, and, and again, as we mentioned before we started, what a wonderful lesson. Yeah. Our, our general conference, Sabbath School Department, uh, quarter after quarter, puts out great lessons for us to study. And I certainly hope as a church that we're taking the opportunity to study these lessons. Um, uh, we only have three verses to try to identify who this Melchizedek, who he was. Um, but we do know that he was a king. He was the king of Salem, which is a region in Canaanite territory. Salem will later on be renamed uh, Jerusalem. So Salem uh, is actually in the word Jerusalem. And Salem is the region that uh, Melchizedek was the king over. Um, his name, um, and again, what we're looking at Melchizedek and how he, re how he prefigures Jesus Christ. His name means, uh, my king is righteous or king of righteousness. So keep that in mind. Um, not only was he a king, but he was also a priest. He was the priest of God Most High. Therefore, he is a king and he is a priest. He brought to Abram bread and wine. He brought provisions. And the Bible says he brought a blessing for Abram. Um, Abram was a great man. Uh, he had, the Bible says, over 300 trained soldiers, all that were born in his household. So if he had over 300 trained soldiers born in his household, he had many more other people and servants that were a part of his household. But when Melchizedek came, uh, Abram paid tithe to him. So apparently he, Abram, considered Melchizedek a much more important and higher person than himself, a person that was due Abram's respect and his honor. And why Paul select Melchizedek uh, to compare to Christ is obvious because of the other uh, only Old Testament reference to Melchizedek is found in Psalms 110. Uh, Psalms 110, that whole entire chapter is seven verses long, and it is entitled, The Announcement of the Messiah's Reign. The Announcement of the, the Messiah's Reign. Talking about Psalms 110. Verse 4 says, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You, coming Messiah, are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So from Genesis to Psalms, we find two references to Melchizedek. It's interesting to note that all during uh, Israel's history, the priesthood and the kingship were totally separate responsibilities. They were never united. Uh, in fact, the lineage of the priests 
was mandated to have to be um, from the Levi tribe. And uh, the Levi tribe alone were to be ordained as the priest. Um, and for the most part, the kings came down through Judea's uh, lineage. And so Paul read, uh, obviously, Psalms 110, but Paul also read Zechariah chapter 6. Uh, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, the Bible declares that there's a man coming, and his name would be called the branch. This is very important. The Bible declares that this man who was called the branch, uh, he would uh, 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 bring a union of the priesthood and the kingship, even though it was mandated they were to be separate. But the branch, we all know is Jesus Christ, would bring a union of the priesthood and the kingship. And so... Zechariah declares that he would both sit and rule on his throne as the king. Also, Zechariah says in the verse 14, sorry, the verse 13, that he would be priest on his throne. So that's interesting. That's an interesting uh, 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 parallel as we connect the dots between uh, Melchizedek. Uh, order as priest and king, and Jesus Christ as priest and king. So, how does Melchizedek foreshadow Christ? Real quickly, my time is gone. King of righteousness, number one. Number two, Melchizedek was not a Levi. Jesus Christ was not a Levi. Uh, his name, king of righteousness, I mentioned that. Um, also, uh, Melchizedek brought blessings. He brought bread and wine. Jesus gave us bread and wine from his own body. Uh, uh, Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without descent. That does not mean that he was divinity. It simply means that we don't know. Uh, Jesus Christ has no beginning. He has no end. He alone was the one that was in the beginning with God. He was God in the beginning, and he was in fact God. And so, it is clear that with these verses, we see that there is a parallel between the order of Melchizedek, a king and priest, and Jesus Christ, who is our king and priest. Jesus Christ alone is the undisputed King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. And he also is our great high priest. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Fowler. You know, as I studied this lesson, I was really struck by how the Bible is very, very connected in terms of the things that we read, the things that we read about in the Old Testament and in the New. There's a connection. And there's purpose behind what happened in the, in the olden days and what happened once Jesus came. And so I thought that this lesson did a good job of tying things together and making sense between the Levitical priesthood, for example, and Jesus as our high priest. So on Tuesday's lesson, we look at Jesus as an effective priest. And in this lesson, we compare the priesthood of the, under Levi, the Levitical priesthood, to that of Jesus. And the animal sacrifices, which were part of the ceremonial law in the book of Leviticus, what was the purpose of those sacrifices? Well, as mentioned before, these were pointing towards what was to come. Jesus, who would be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, who would give his life and shed his blood for us. Now, there's a reason why the ceremonial law and those Levitical priests were not enough. And so in order to understand that, we need to look closely at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. And let's look at that for a little bit here. It says, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? 
You see, the, the Levitical priesthood was not enough. It was not sufficient enough or effective enough to pay for our sins. The other thing that had a shortcoming was the ceremonial law itself. Those animal sacrifices, remember? They had to go when they sinned and find a sheep or a ram or a goat and sacrifice it, right, in order to pay for their sins. But there is something that that could not do. It could not bring true repentance to the heart of the sinner. It was just a shadow of things to come. Now, in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 18 to 19, it says, For there is an annulling of a foregoing commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect, and a bringing in thereupon of a better hope, through which we draw nigh unto God. In other words, that old sacrificial ceremony of bringing sheep and ram and goat in order to pay for our sins had to be done away with because those things were not sufficient to pay for the sin of man. It was necessary for us to have a sinless human being who could pay for our sins. And that is the reason that Jesus came. In Hebrews 7, verse 13 to 16, it says this, For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. He was not appointed by man. For it is evident, verse 14, that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Verse 15, and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest. Verse 16, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Jesus was eternal. It's important to learn that according to the laws of that time, no one could serve as priest unless he belonged to the family of Aaron of the tribe of Levi. The law of the Levitical priesthood was designed to operate only until Jesus Christ, to whom it pointed, took over his office. So everything had a plan. Everything had a purpose. Then it was to be annulled. The annulment, that means something had to be declared invalid. Uh, usually we think of that in terms of like a marriage or an agreement that had to be annulled. But this uh, ceremonial law had to be annulled because it was never meant to be uh, eternal. It was never meant to really pay the price for our sins. It could not change our hearts. So Jesus, it pointed towards the coming of Jesus. Here is the invalidation of the Levitical law. Once Christ, to whom the, this law pointed, began his priestly ministry or service. Now in Hebrews 10 and verse 17 and 18, it says this, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. The sacrifices and offering became a ritual without true conversion of the heart. God had no pleasure in these sacrifices. Christ did the will of God in providing the true sacrifice, a more effective sacrifice. So we'll move on now to Wednesday's lesson, which looks at another characteristic of the priesthood of Jesus, and that is an eternal priest. Elder Martin, won't you lead us through that lesson? Thank you. An eternal priest. I was just here thinking, and I wanted to get some feedback from you. And let me take my glasses off so I can see you. We, we've gone through, you're students of the Bible, and you know that there have been many high priests. So let me ask you a couple questions here. Aaron, one of the first high priests, is he still alive today? No. Okay, let's try another one. Eli, is he alive today? No. Samuel, is he alive today? You are excellent students of the Bible. They are all dead. Wednesday is entitled, The Eternal High Priest, which suggests to me someone who lives for ever and ever. It's kind of hard for me to even wrap my brain around that, but I'm thankful that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is our faithful and eternal high priest. Just thought I'd just throw that in. That just came to my mind. On Wednesday's lesson, it begs the question, on what basis did Jesus become priest? And we have a text, too. We are supposed to read in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 16. I trust 
that you have read it, but if you haven't, it said, Who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of a what? An endless life. I, I kind of like, I, I must admit, I kind of like when the quarterly asks the questions and then gives us some insight into the answers. Sometimes we need that. And this was one of those uh, uh, occasions. For right under the question it says, Jesus received the priesthood on the basis of an indestructible life and because he holds an eternal ministry. The implication of these facts are astounding. It means that Jesus' ministry will never be surpassed or outclassed. And I like when it, how it goes on to say, Jesus saves how? Completely, eternally, and I like this old English word, to the uttermost. Not a word we use regularly, but you understand what it means. To the uttermost. And I've even heard some preachers say, to the guttermost as well. And it goes on to say the salvation that Jesus provides is total and final. I want to make sure you're listening and following with me today. And then it uses another old English word. It says it reaches the innermost aspects of human nature. Jesus' intercession before God involves all the benefits granted under the new covenant. Oh, what a savior is Jesus. Because he became genuinely human, taking our flesh and blood, yet he became our great eternal high priest, the mediator between God and man. Jesus Christ, we studied this week, is the God-man bridging in himself the chasm between heaven and earth that was created when our first parents sinned in the Garden of Eden. The earthly sanctuary had pointed to him. If you notice, the earthly sanctuary did not point to Samuel. It did not point to, to Aaron. It pointed to one eternal one, Jesus Christ. The sanctuary service, if you recall, centered in sacrifices and priests. The blood of lamb, goats, bull, and oxen offered by the penitent sinner foreshadowed whom? Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 puts it this way. For there is only one God, one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus, wrote the Apostle Paul. Then he goes on to say, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, which Wednesday's lesson touches on. And those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15. Here we find in the book of Hebrews this week, the truth of Jesus being our great high priest. Now let me just cut some stuff out and jump over here right from the beginning. You recall in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we have this prophetic promise where God pledged Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. even way back then, as the guarantor for the effectiveness of what he promised. This is another reason why Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Now, let me take my time and explain what I'm about to say. When someone makes a will to distribute their worldly possessions, the will cannot be enforced until after the person's death. We agree with that, right? Yeah. Today we have heard many headlines of uh, husbands or a wife would probably take out a life insurance on their spouse and then they do some devious work to get them killed so that they can then go in and cash out the life insurance. You have heard that, right? Yeah. Now listen carefully. This is, in effect, what Jesus subjected himself to for the human race. Follow me. Follow me carefully. Jesus drew up a divine will to save us from sin and then willingly died so that we can get the inheritance. But it gets better. It doesn't stop there. Jesus does the impossible. He makes the will. He dies to enforce the will. And here's the cool part. He comes back 
to mediate the distribution of the will which he offered upon his death. Isn't that great? Amen. This is forgiveness to the uttermost from the sewage of sin. And it contains gracious provisions of grace and mercy and love. And get this, the power to overcome. In the new covenant, the weakness of the priests was replaced by the endless life of our guarantor, Jesus Christ. As Elder Fowler said, he is the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Last point here. Furthermore, the oath in the new covenant is a guarantee. Human oaths expire when a person dies, okay? But the Father's oath about Jesus' priesthood is eternal because they, Father and Son, will never die. His promises are certain. Jesus is indeed our faithful and eternal high priest. Amen, amen. How reassuring to know that we have an eternal priest. Amen. And we already studied that we have an effective priest. Well, we're going to move on to Thursday's lesson that talks about Jesus as a sinless priest. Elder Fowler. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Hebrews 7.26, if you have your Bibles, turn to that text. Uh, let's, let's look at that. Hebrews 7.26, for such... A high priest is fitting for us. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. As you heard Dr. Fox, Fox read as our memory text this week. These all are just some of the attributes, uh, qualities that Jesus Christ has that qualifies him plus so many other things that we can't even imagine as our high priest. Uh, and that Paul is saying it is Jesus is the perfect one to represent humanity before God. And what an awesome, awesome uh, uh, blessing that is for us as sinners is to have Jesus Christ represent us before the Father. Um, and why angels are not qualified to do that task. Uh, Peter kind of chimes in on that in, in 1 Peter 1.20, that it was Christ who was indeed uh, foreordained from the foundation of the world to redeem us. So all along it was Jesus' task to redeem us and then represent us as the high priest before the Father. And so Paul lists these things, these qualities, that Jesus had um, to, to represent us as the high priest. The Bible declares that he was tempted in all points as we are. Tempted, not just in most of the things that we deal with. The Bible declares he was tempted in all points like we are, yet he is the only Holy One. That is the first thing Paul says makes him a perfect individual to represent us before God because he lived like you and I, was tempted like you and I, yet without sin. Therefore, he represents us before the Father. The Bible says he was harmless. One of these ways that we discover this is when the children came to him and the disciples wanted to push them aside, Jesus said, no, 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 suffer even the children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. I, I have come to bring life. I, I didn't come to hurt or destroy I've come to save. I didn't even come to judge at this point in time. I come to give you peace and life and deliverance from all the various and sundry ways that we've been captivated and made captive by the evil one. Another quality that Jesus has, the Bible says, after uh, his holiness and his harmlessness, 
is his quality of being undefiled. Uh, this uh, connotates his pure religion, uh, pure and religious and moral qualities, uh, his theologies, his golden rule. The golden rule has stood the test of time. Just treat people the way you want to be treated. He was undefiled in his religious beliefs and his religious practices. He was the teacher sent from God, and all of his teachings have stood the test of time. Not one of his lessons has been proved to be obsolete or unimportant. And so his religion is undefiled. His fourth attribute, as mentioned by Paul, was he was separate from sinners. And as we study this, there are two connotations that this particular aspect or attribute of Jesus Christ could mean. And both are actually accurate and fitting uh, to qualify Jesus to represent us before God as our high priest. Number one, again, separate from sinners. Uh, as you know, he mingled with sinners. He mingled with sinners. Yet his garments were not stained. His, his garments were unblemished. He is the lamb that, whose garments are without spot or blemish. That could be one meaning that Paul was thinking of when he said separate from sinners. Another meaning could be is that he has completed his earthly ministry. And now, away from us, he is in heaven with his Father conducting his heavenly ministry for us. So either one of those, or even both of those, are fitting for Jesus to qualify as our high priest. Lastly, Paul says that because he is our high priest, that he has done a great thing, as, as Elder and Sis mentioned. Uh, keep in mind that there, there was a gulf between us and God. Uh, there was a breach between the creator and the creator. There was a schism, if you please. Uh, and we were created for God's glory, as I conclude. But this separation was in place, and no one could fix it until Jesus, the branch, came along. And because he reconciled us to God, because he squashed the rebellion, and proved that the rebellion was without merit, and the rebellion was senseless, and reconciled us back to God because of what Jesus has done. His name is glorified amen. above all names in the universe. Yes. Let the church say amen. amen. And that's the last quality that Paul ascribes to Jesus Christ as our high priest. Amen. How beautiful. Thank you, Elder. You know, as we wrap up this week's lesson, I can't help but feel gratitude to Jesus for what he has done for us. I can't help but love him so much the more. Why? Because he first loved us. Now, under Friday's section where it concludes our lesson, there were some beautiful thoughts expressed, and I thought I would just read them in your hearing. The first, which is taken from Ellen G. White's SDA Bible Commentary, says, Christ is watching. He knows all about our burdens, our dangers, and our difficulties, the things that we're going through now. And he fills his mouth with arguments in our behalf. He fits his intercessions to the needs of each soul, everyone. As he did in the case of Peter, our advocate fills his mouth with arguments to teach his tried, tempted ones to brace against Satan's temptations. He interprets every movement of the enemy. He orders events. So even now, Christ is still in control. He's advocating on our behalf. And what a beautiful thought that is. The lesson asks the question, 
What does that promise mean to you? Think about what this teaches us about God's love for us. Why is this idea so encouraging? Why do we need someone arguing on our behalf? Well, brothers and sisters, we are not able to do so for ourselves. We, as good as we try to be, our goodness is not enough to pay the price for our sins. Jesus has already done so. And so he, as our eternal high priest, continues to advocate on our behalf. Now, the second paragraph under Friday's lesson was also quite beautiful. And this one was taken from The Desire of Ages, pages 25 and 26. And it says, it was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, we became more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. Praise God. In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Praise God. This is the pledge that God will fulfill his word. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. God has adopted human nature in the person of his son. God adopted human nature in the person of his son. Wow. And has carried the same into the highest heaven. It is the Son of Man who shares the throne of the universe. It is the Son of Man whose name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, from Isaiah 9 and verse 6. The I Am is the daysman between God and humanity, laying his hand upon both. Wow. Wow. He who is holy, like we said before, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, is not ashamed to, be, to call us brethren. Wow. It's like royalty has been conferred upon us. Hebrews 7, 26, 2, 11 says, In Christ, the family of earth and the family of heaven are bound together. I, I think that is so powerful. Christ glorified is our brother. Heaven is enshrined in humanity, and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. I, I am just in awe when I think about what Christ has done for us and how it is eternal, is it, effe it is effective, uh, it is sinless, and it really guarantees us eternal life with him. And we don't have to be worried so much about the things that we face from day to day when we realize what Christ is doing even now on our behalf. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to continue to study these lessons. I will just tell you that as I study them, I am drawn closer to God, closer to God who loved, first loved us and sent his son to die in our place so that we might have eternal life. Amen. Why don't we bow our heads for our closing prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us and for giving us Jesus, who is our eternal high priest. We thank you for his sacrifice, for the fact that he gave his life to pay the price for sin and allow us to be re, uh, recom recommitted and reconnected with you. Father, we thank you for allowing us to join that royal family, that royal priesthood, and to be able to call Jesus our brother. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. And we pray that you will continue to encourage us as we go through each day and each week that the price has already been paid, and for that we are eternally grateful. Please bless us now, Lord, as we continue to worship in your presence. May everything that is done be to your name's praise, honor, and glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. This morning, we will be talking about friendship and brotherly love. Soon after a man bought a farm, he met his na nearest neighbor. Have you bought this place? Asked the neighbor. Yes, was the reply. Well, sir, I don't know if you've noticed, but your fence is 10 feet on my side of the line, and I am going to take this matter to court and prove my claim to it. The newcomer said, oh, don't do that. If the fence is on your side of the line, we will just take it up and move it. Then said the neighbor, that fence stays just where it is. A man with an attitude like yours doesn't need to be sued. Christian brotherly love has made a friend. In this story, instead of being upset and angry with the neighbor, the new neighbor was kind and decided to make things easier for the both of them. Instead of making an enemy, the new neighbor was nice and reasonable and made a friend. He showed qualities of what a true friend is like. Hate often does more harm to the hater than the hated. Stimulated by excitement of hatred, adrenaline is pumped to the blood, making the body tense and prepared for emergencies that may never come. I'm sure you can tell that hating people all the time will have a negative effect on your body, your nerves, and of course your mind. People who hate all the time instead of making friends and showing love hurt themselves in the long run. A story is told of three Arabs who are talking about the difference between night and day. How do you know, asks one, when night has passed and day has come and darkness will never return? Answered one, when I need not the light of the candle to show me my direction, then I know the night has passed and day has come. And you, he asks the second one. Oh, came the answer. When I am able to thread a needle without the use of artificial light, then I know the night has passed and day has come. Both of you are wrong, said the Arab. There is but one proof that night has passed and day has come. It is when you look in the face of your brother and recognize him in the image of God, no matter the color of his skin or the texture of his hair or the language that he speaks. Amen. Then you may be sure that night has passed and day has come and darkness will never more return. In this story, the Arabs learn that when you see your friend's face, you can love them, no matter what they look like or where they come from. Do any of you have any friends that are willing to help you and look out for you? Are you willing to do the same for them? Jesus says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John 13:55. It's always best to be friendly, boys and girls, because God smiles at us whenever we show love to one another and make new friends. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for waking us up this morning and bringing us here safely. Please help us to be friendly and help us to make friends and not make enemies. Amen.